Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast, where hunters new and old come to learn and find inspiration from stories of hunts gone by. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the outdoor way of life, and there is no better time to start than right now. So let's head into the great outdoors with your host, Dylan Ray. All right, guys, welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast. I am incredibly, incredibly excited about today's episode. Uh, why? Because it's a little different for me. Um, and, and I got fired up. So my, my dad is not easily impressed. And, uh, you know, he's just one of those guys that usually is, is pretty, like, laid back about everything. Just like, oh, that's that's cool, man. And uh, and when I set this appointment up, I called my dad because I know he's an alone fan. And I said, Dad, uh, do you know who Jordan Jonas is? And uh, my dad went off. He was like, dude, killed a moose, <laughs> killed a wolverine. That dude, I, from the beginning, I knew he was legit and uh, just went off on you. So I'm like, well, if my dad's impressed – then I know it's going to be a good call. So <laughs> what an honor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you fired up my dad. I mean, if that, if that means anything. Yeah. To me. but, uh, so we have with us Jordan Jonas season six winner of alone. Jordan, how are you, man? I'm doing really good. Good to be on here. Good to chat with you. I got a little jealous because, uh, <clears throat> when your phone, when we connected, I just heard <laughs> birds chirping and, and I could almost feel the sun shining and, and I'm like, he's somewhere beautiful right now. And yeah. uh, Kansas, we're getting snow this week, so. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, it's the uh, best time of the year here in Virginia right now. And so I found this little nice, pretty spot in the woods kind of behind my house. And yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> Sounds like it. Like, yeah, when you yeah, answer yeah. the phone, I'm like, I immediately became jealous of where you were at in the world. Good, good, good. <laughs> <Just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, before we dive in, uh, give us a quick introduction to yourself. Um, if you're a fan of Alone, uh, you don't need much of an introduction, but uh, give us a quick introduction to yourself, my friend. Yeah, my, I mean, my name is obviously Jordan Jonas. Grew up in uh, uh, on a farm in North Idaho and uh, spent most of my uh, youth there. And then when, you know, when I was about 19 or so, I got, I went traveling around the U.S. on on freight trains and that kind of made my life take an unusual turn just because it was a new perspective for a young guy and so then i uh we ended up in virginia and started you know found a town where houses were really cheap and started just renovating houses kind of as a job but then i also got uh through a to make a long story short heard about uh uh, a guy in Russia who was building orphanages and doing some cool things over there and needed a hand. And so, uh, I, uh, you know, at the time just prayed about it and felt like it was something I real, I should go over and give a hand to. And, uh, I went over there, just bought a ticket for a year and headed over there and, uh, didn't have much of an agenda, but I, I just kind of followed where the doors, uh, opened when I was there I you know so I helped with that orphanage a bit and then I went to a Russian village and just lived with some Russian families got introduced to some native fur trappers up north and the fur trappers introduced me to some reindeer herders that are nomads <laughs> and kind of just one thing after another uh just carried through me through a pretty interesting decade there heading back and forth to Russia and spending a lot of time uh in Siberia so that was kind of the gist of it. I, I, uh, you know, through doing that, I'd actually also watched. I don't watch much TV, but my buddy had showed me the Alone show. I was like, oh, that's a pretty cool show. So I watched it, and uh, I think it was after season two or something. I sent them a link to my YouTube videos. I was like, hey, I could do that, and then <laughs> uh, they uh, they didn't get back to me for years. And honestly, I forgot I had even applied, but they reached out. Uh, years later i was just working on a driveway in dc we're building some driveway and uh got a call and so then that whole story part of the story happened <laughs> anyway that's a quick intro but man yeah. i've got i've got so many questions i don't even know where to start um <laughs> which usually doesn't happen you know usually i'm pretty laid out on what i want to talk about that's but good. um i've just got man i'm so i'm so i don't know thrilled about this but also intrigued and uh so before we dive in, uh, before this completely goes wherever it's going to go, let me give a quick thank you to our friends over at RMS, Rocky Mountain Specialty Gear. 
um, Tom Clum and Dan Clum over there, they put out some incredible, my favorite thing about them is all of the informational stuff they put out on traditional shooting. Um, and, and Tom is just a, a legend when it comes to coaching and, and instructing. And so, A, if you're looking to improve on your traditional shooting, I would highly recommend you following them. And then you can purchase Tom's program and, and work through that and really uh, become a lot more efficient with your recurve longbow. Uh, but also they sell some incredible specialty gear um, and more of like your high-end out western specialty gear. So go check out Rocky Mountain Specialty Gear uh, or RMS Gear on social media uh, because those guys are absolutely just incredible. Yeah. Um, so, Jordan, my favorite thing, and, uh, you know, I kind of stumbled upon this after looking into you a bit, was – was your part about the mission work and uh you know i don't dive a lot into this uh, on the podcast but uh uh-huh. you know i'm actually i'm actually a youth pastor uh, that's what i do for oh, a living right and so yeah, yeah. i was i was incredibly um i was incredibly pleased by the fact that and you just said it yourself you prayed about what the lord would have you to do and uh and that's what that's that's where you went and uh and that's how you got to where you're at today essentially um uh-huh. yeah. so that's just an awesome incredible testimony man but uh so at what point I'm curious to know where you met your wife at in this. No. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's good. I, it was, uh, what was that? Probably I went to Russia when I was 21 first time. And I think I was probably, I'm trying to think 28 when I met my wife. So I'd been, you know, in Russia quite a while. I met her randomly at a uh, wedding I went to in Canada that I kind of just went to at the last minute just with some buddies and, uh, it was in Toronto. We went up there, and uh, my wife had just spent a couple years living in China. You know, at the time we were just meeting, and and you know, but we kind of hit it off talking about living in Asia. <laughs> and so we had a lot to talk about. We talked about. I mean, I remember uh, speaking to her about like I just read the Gulag Archipelago, and that was a real profound book for me. So. And she had read that also, so we. I remember talking about that. Anyway, I met her randomly at a wedding in Toronto, which uh, would have been fairly unpredictable. But I guess that's how those kind of things go. But, but uh, uh, she's, yeah. you know, from New York and uh, had a lot different upbringing than I did. That's for sure. And uh, but she's also was game to go to Siberia. So when we got married, she she, she followed me over there and spent a good old siberian winter in the teepees out there and uh spent a summer out there too so spent a year with me out in the wilderness in siberia so she's apparently an adaptable person also <laughs> so before we move on i gotta ask you what do you call yourself do you call yourself a survivalist or a um, um that's funny you know i no, not necessarily i mean i guess uh that w- i would fit the bill there but i i you know, I didn't even know that was a thing, really. I, the, my path is kind of, you know, unique in that way, and that a lot of the, it's kind of, th- you know, a journey I was led on, but it wasn't something that I sought out specifically. But as, as my experience gathered, and I, you know, I was, I spent a lot of time living with people who, uh, who, you know, survive in the wilderness all the time, and so I was able to learn what is actually effective, what people actually do and kind of separate a lot of the wheat from the chaff in that, in that realm. And that, that, you know, so yeah, in in some ways, but I would usually when I refer to it, survivalists also kind of indicate like you're surviving in a way you're usually just trying to get rescued. And the part of, of wilderness, I guess I would call like wilderness living that I like is actually being able to spend good long prolonged times in the wilderness and like feel right. the richness of the life that you know we kind of were all designed for in a way <laughs> but you're not you're not and, and you know you can correct me if i'm wrong but mm-hmm. uh, you're not being a survivalist but you're thriving you know you're not just simply surviving yeah. in the wilderness you're thriving in the wilderness yeah and, and that would be the goal for sure you know like every it, there's no guarantees out in those situations, but you can do a lot to increase the odds of it going well for yourself. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I'm all about gathering, uh, as much knowledge and, and experience in that realm as I can, because I have found, that's what I found kind of just 
uh, organically over time was just living in the wilderness, like with the natives and stuff. I was just amazed to, to come to the understanding that, wow, if, you know, if this really was my friends and my family, you know, uh, I would choose this life over the modern way of life, especially now with the, with the kind of safety net that we have, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, so, uh, I, I it really felt, I really feel like, and I feel like a lot of people would come to that conclusion if they had the opportunity to, um, kind of get there, you know? And so it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, but yeah, that's what I like to, uh, that's the space I like to dwell in. And that's the type of wilderness, uh, if you want to call it survival or living that I like to share with people, you know, is like, hopefully give them a glimpse of what that is. And then that's something they can take with on their own journey through life that's hopefully an advantage for them <laughs> but, yeah. so kind of walk me through was this you know I and, and I don't know how you grew up um uh -huh. but, but was growing up were you, were you kind of that of that mindset of like I want to be the type of guy that can go live out you know in the wilderness and 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 thrive yeah, absolutely. And, and... i mean that's a funny question uh, it is funny you know my we lived on a farm in idaho so you're naturally always doing stuff outside we had you know a bunch of acres and all that so we we're always camping and doing things like that but my dad wasn't an avid outdoorsman or anything he wasn't a hunter or anything so i kind of came across that later in life and uh had to pick that up somewhat independently um uh, but yeah, growing up, oh, but I almost lost track of the question. It was hit me again with it. R really just, you know, kind of the idea of like, Oh, you... was I, yeah, was I always wanting to do that? Yeah. Um, not, not necessarily, I gotta say not necessarily. I, I've always, you know, I think back when I was younger, I thought a lot about, I was, I've always really been into history and I think I always thought, you know, doing things like. I'd like to be an archaeologist or an <laughs> anthropologist or something like that when I was younger. But I uh, uh, I kind of came across the passion for the outdoors. Um, of course, as a child, those those seeds were all in me, but uh, they really flourished when I lived with the natives in Russia. I think that's where I was like, wow, this is this is the life in a way. <laughs> and I. Uh, uh, and that might be underplaying my, you know, how much that was a role in my childhood, but I, I guess it, yeah, at all, that's where I, that's where that, I think that's where, um, my path set me out from what, you know, maybe the norm is for people who grow up in Idaho. <laughs> yeah. Everybody of course likes the outdoors and everybody does some hunting and fishing and this and that it's all in there, but it kind of got taken to the next level living with natives out there in Siberia and all that. So when those doors began to open, was it almost like, okay, I'm going to step through this one. I'm going to step through this one. And then all of a sudden you're some bad to the bone, uh, <laughs> survivalist, or was it like, okay, I'm going to do what I need to do to set myself up for this. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it was just step by step. I was, uh, I was just kind of taking it as it came and, and, that was, you know, that was the same. I, honestly, when I first went to Russia, I can't say I even knew that the Evenki, who were the tribal group that I'd live with, you know, that people like that still lived in those kind of pretty traditional ways. And so uh, when I did meet them, I loved the way of life. And it just, you know, just led over time to acquiring more skills. And it wasn't just with them, but it was always also with you know, Russian fur trappers who were really generous with their knowledge and time and took me out and blah, 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 you know? And so it just, it developed, but I'd say it was pretty organically and it wasn't ever my specific goal. My, my, my goal was, you know, just more to, uh, I mean, it, it just was constantly an evolving <laughs> yeah. path, I guess is all I can say. No, but, uh, sense. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I was just curious to know, like, if that was something like you set out on like purposely, like, okay, yeah, no, you know, it really wasn't. It really wasn't. Now, I, you know, now it's something that I really enjoy and it's something I like to learn more about and and expound upon constantly and practice. And now it's really, I find it really gratifying to have a skill set that allows me to just, you know, pick a spot on Google Earth and go there and survive. have a good chance of thriving. Right. <laughs> so, and, and so it's... Uh, you need yeah, to make your own but, brand. You need to make your own brand. Uh, I don't know how to say this, and I might sound really dumb, but like survivalist. 
<laughs> they're thriving yeah no <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress but I it'll be cool. <laughs> yeah totally no, i think the i think playing on the puns can be as divisive as anything <laughs> you gotta be real careful with those <laughs> <laughs> so so now since now since um alone um mm-hmm. How has your life changed, man? I mean, what do you do? Do do you? I mean, the day to day is really similar. You know, I like uh, in a lot of ways. the The thing that's been the greatest, the most positive change is I've been able to shift from making a living doing, you know, renovating old houses and stuff, (laughs) and kind of going into uh, training, survival training, and teaching people wilderness. Uh, skills and and kind of opening up that world to people in different ways, whether it be through doing some talks and doing, I, you know, I have all my, basically my whole summer's booked up in the mountains, just going to be teaching courses. And uh, that, that's been awesome. I got to say, it's such a, it's a dream job. I love it. And it's been really positive for the people that come out there also, which is, uh, just really gratifying to see you know it's kind of it was kind of a new thing so i didn't know how it was going to go and it's just gone really well and <laughs> yeah so i'm not sure how i'm not sure how tv works um you know i don't know yeah. how i don't know how long ago that was filmed versus how it long was, it was filmed in 2018 so okay. i guess like two years ago or something so what have you have you done any more kind of um you know, long stays since then. Have you have you done that? Like, pick a spot on Google and say, "I'm going here, and I'm gonna thrive for six months." Come pick me back up in six well, months. Well, in a way, I wish. Like, I uh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of my happy place. I, but I do have uh, three little kids right now, so it's kind of that season of life where I have you know a one year old and a three year old and a four year old, and so we've been pretty busy with them, and I can't uh, leave them for too long. You know, I, I was pretty much gone all summer teaching courses last year. And then uh, this year it'll be the same thing. But at the end of that, at the end of those courses this year, I'm going to take the family out. We're going to, and, and just go into the wilderness for a few weeks. Just with the What does that look like? Family. I mean, how does yeah, it that's a good, You know, I haven't done it with the family. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be a new experience. I'm, a, I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to it. What I do know is, you know, like, even in Siberia, living with the the kids out in the woods, once they probably get over the initial, once they get into the, that rhythm of life, they seem to do really well. You know, they're, yeah. they're always running around and playing out there. And, you know, there's going to be berries around and it's just going to be, you know, they fish and run around. And anyway, so I, I think, I think they'll get into the rhythm, but it might be, you know, a little bit of a transition period for him, but that's why I don't want to go up for just a few days. I want to go up for weeks, you know, so they can yeah, so, so almost feel like that's how life is. And uh, <laughs> I ask you this because the first time I took my kids camping, a uh, mm-hmm. little quick story for you, I took mm-hmm. my kids camping. And of course we're sleeping in like a, you know, an eight person tent. We've got a grill. We've got, you know, we've brought yeah. and hamburgers, <laughs> hot dogs. And we're only like half a mile from a 12,000 square foot lodge. Yeah. <laughs> and we go and set up this tent. And my boy at the time was probably a year and a half old. And so uh-huh. he's still sleeping in like a, uh, like a pack and play, like a little portable crib, you know, uh-huh. um, he's sleeping in that. And I don't know, maybe 1am it comes the worst storm I've ever been in while camping. And I'm like, crap, like I've run this for my family. Um, oh yeah they now have a bitter taste in their mouth and <laughs> and my boy actually never never batted an eye i'm i'm talking like i'm checking uh, google I, i'm checking i'm checking the weather making sure like the creek's not gonna rise and we're not gonna get swept away it was horrible and right. uh, my boy yeah, never board. batted an eye thunder cracking all around us and i'm like good lord what am i gonna do here <laughs> um and we ended up just going back to sleep and uh but I, in my mind, I thought I've ruined this for them. So, with uh-huh. your first family adventure, trying to get them out there, um, mm-hmm. do you pick? Do you pick? You know, I mean, where do you pick? You pick Middle Missouri, where you know it's. Oh no, I'm gonna try to. So what we're doing is we're renting some llamas uh, uh, from some nice folks out there in Idaho, and uh, gonna take those llamas basically deep into the wilderness there i'm gonna you know i don't have a specific plan but i'm gonna uh go uh you know maybe a mile all day you know a day but it's 
by the time you spend a few weeks, you might be able to get pretty far in there. I'd love to get kind of up into the peak of the mountains where you're at the high mountain lakes. And, uh, so that's what I want to slowly venture out to. And I think we can do it. I think it, uh, if we just take it easy and don't push the, push them too hard, but try to kind of just make it fun as we go. And, uh, so, you know, of course I've taken the kids camping and stuff and they always look forward to it, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to get them past the camping frame of mind and get them kind of where they are, get a taste of that. Just life is life in the woods, <laughs> you know, thing, which I think yeah. is valuable. No, that makes sense. Man, Idaho is, is one of the greatest places on earth. <laughs> um, I just, I love it, man. I went on one bear hunt out there and, uh, I just fell in love with it. And uh, I remember just coming home and telling my wife, like Idaho's never been on our list, but now we need to go back um, because it's just, you know, and and that's what's so great about, about exploring and getting out there is you find these places and you're like, I ne- this was never on my radar, but, but this is just an incredible place. Oh yeah. That's awesome. And it is so fun to find those places you just love. And uh, it's inspiring. I love that. You know, that's what I love about the mountains and stuff. Just being inspired by nature and wanting to get over that next hill and see what's the, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. And, so, uh, yeah. I can honestly say, I didn't think this was going to go the way of talking about getting kids in the wilderness, but, um, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the moose. Um, oh, yeah. man, I, I put it out on Facebook and Instagram this morning and, uh, just said, I'm so excited for this conversation. Cannot wait for it. And, and several comments were like, that dude made it look like a vacation. And, uh, that <laughs> dude just ruled it. And, uh, I mean, and, and my dad even said, he's like, from the get go, I just saw this guy and I'm like, he's going to win. Um, yeah. and so what was your game plan going into it from the start of, of, and I kind of want to run through your gear list a little bit, but, uh, mm-hmm. what was your game plan going into it? You know, how, how did you attack this from a, from a, hunt well, it was interesting because prior to my season, no one had ever gotten big game on alone. And, uh, and I'm a skinny guy with a fast metabolism and, I knew that I was going to need to provide a lot of food. I, there, there, you know, I know everybody before that show and there was a lot of, of course I went on Reddit and was checking out the Reddit because you see what people are saying about it. Once I found out I was going on there and there were a lot of like high profile people that were basically saying there's no way to provide enough calories in the wilderness to, uh, survive long term. It's basically a starving game, no matter what you do. Of course, I knew that didn't have to be the case. And so <laughs> just from experience, but it was, it made it, a, it was a very tangible um, burden on my shoulders. Like I definitely, I felt like I was digging myself out of a hole, just being basically the thinnest guy. And I knew starving just was not going to work. So I had a plan right off the bat. I had, you know, plans A, B, and C, and D to get some kind of big game and i had you know for every potential type of game out there i had a little bit different potential strategy and uh it just kind of took me getting on the ground to see what might be available and then of course it's never as you imagine it (laughs) so then uh you have to adjust all your plans and move forward but yeah right i mean it was always my plan to go go out go all out for big game and i knew it was possible especially in those northern regions you know i have a lot a fair amount of experience up there and people can live up there but it's just you know matter you know it's just a matter of unlocking the potential of whatever your spot has to offer uh i know you know the north is a cool place and but there's all the little micro areas you know i kind of I kind of thought that my best chance would be to get a bear. And so that was always kind of plan A, but I was in that burn and there were no berries and no, thus there were really no bear and there were no, and so like in Russia, when I had lived alone, um, I just was living off a of grouse, getting grouse basically every day, eating a lot of grouse and of course fish and stuff like that. And I, I, I assumed that would be my main staple, but just getting thrown out there and having the burn, it was like, Oh, there's no grouse. There's no bear. So kind of plan A and B aren't there, but let's, you know, let's go for moose. (laughs) And that, you know, and so I was just adjusting my plan and, and 
and you can kind of see of course it's all condensed down so you only get little glimpses of it but uh once i had seen signs of moose i uh i really hit that hard and you know i i had a bunch of little strategies to increase my odds of an encounter with them that i put into play out there and and yeah it was like every waking moment was some sort of food procurement for me <laughs> i you yeah. know set out hundreds of snares and a, a, you know the whole the whole thing but uh yeah so for me that was it just i knew i could be out there as long as i wanted as long as i had food that was going to be the thing that made me leave now, so that was all my stress <laughs> yeah now how do you go about um so being dropped into a new place um well, yeah. first question is first question is um your decision to take a recurve uh-huh you know that we just came off of our traditional one on one series we just wrapped that up and uh yeah. so your decision to take Good a recurve mm-hmm. was that is that because a recurve is your weapon of choice? I mean, because if I, I mean, if I'm looking at, it, I'm like, I'm gonna take a gun and I'm gonna lay down as many animals as I can. Yeah, no, you're on that show. You know, you're not allowed to take a gun or even a compound bow. So they pretty much limit you to, you know, a long bow or a traditional type bow of some sort. So and was so, a recurve your weapon of choice it, before that, or did you have to? No, become- you know, it was like something I had just started getting into prior, uh, maybe a year before I got on the show. So I was pretty new to it in a way. I had, you know, done a lot of compound hunting, and then uh, there, there was an old guy here in town that gave me his recurve, and I, uh, it, you know, they're actually just more fun to shoot. So I started shooting yeah. it a lot and and uh, got into it, um, but I was fairly new to it, and so, you know, not new to hunting, but new to the recurve in a way. So, yeah, so I had a, I had a lot to learn, and I tried to learn as fast as i could you know of course i'd already been practicing shooting shooting it a lot and i'd got (laughs) the first thing i got actually was a my buddy here in town had this stray dog that kept coming and eating his chickens all the time and you know i was this was right after i got the recurve and i've been practicing out there and then and he called me one night he's like dude that dog's back and and it was in town so i you know you can't shoot anything or anything and i (laughs) I was like let me grab that bow and i ran over there and it was uh it was great. It was, uh, so, you know, in his chicken coop, killing his chickens. And I ran out there again and he, the dog took out from under the fence and, and bolted off. And it was at night and it was, uh, probably 20 yards away and it was in a full run. And I just reached back and shot and it went through both lungs and the heart and it went down immediately. And I was like, Whoa, this is, you know, that's something you couldn't do with a compound bow. It was like just an instinct shot, like happening fast. And, uh, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So, so how anyway. long did it take you to become a, a effective and efficient with that? You know, it's it's constantly, <laughs> constantly improving. I was shooting today, you know, like so. I, uh, I'm still, I'm still learning. You know, I'm still getting better all the time. Yeah, I've recently, just recently, even switched to a different shooting style. You know, instead of split finger, I went three under to like kind of in, improve my aim and uh yeah so i'm i'm still involving i'm no i would never claim i'm the best <laughs> it's just uh but i do enjoy it a lot and and uh living you know in in town here out in virginia they have those you know you can city archery hunt and so you can get a lot of good stocks in and a lot of practice and so it's pretty fun so back to my other question um when you were dropped off you've never had boots on the ground at a place mm-hmm. what what's your first initial walkthrough like what do you begin to do to figure out how am i going to thrive here because i'm a th- yeah, survivalist you have to just like so even as we were coming in on the helicopter i was like just scanning the shoreline to see where potential deep spots might be or where you know like potential yeah. places you might be able to fish and uh so that you're just assessing that right away. You're assessing uh, uh, what kind of forage. Because the nice thing about uh, a lot, especially northern forests, is there's just a ton of berries. So though you might not have your caloric intakes met, you know, you, you can kind of take the edge of hunger off just with that. And so as soon as they set you down, you're just kind of, well, before we even landed, it was a lot of looking at you're trying to absorb as much of your topographical, you know, 
mental picture of your terrain as you can. And then once I was down there, it was immediately looking for tracks and looking at the the forage around, which uh, in general was a bit of a disappointment because of the burn situation. But then I did, you know, I, it was actually, I grabbed my bow right when they dropped me off. I was thinking, you know what, this is one of the most untouched times. You know, there was just a helicopter there. But aside from that, the animals don't know I'm here right now. So I got my bow immediately and started just walking around and doing a little hunting. And I actually got shot a rabbit on my first, like maybe I was there an hour and I saw a rabbit and got that with the recurve. And then uh, that took the pressure off of <laughs> off of the first day's food, you know, so uh yeah and then it gives you intel you're like okay so there's some rabbits here so uh next so i immediately set a bunch of snares you know <laughs> and, and uh then i was right at the start you're assessing where is there you're gonna have a shelter spot that's protected from the wind that's close to water that is also close to a long-term supply of firewood and not hopefully disturbing animal movement patterns you know so there was all those things that Right when they drop you off, you're thinking about all that stuff. And I ended up moving my camp, you know, from where they dropped me off, probably 500 yards, and uh, found a spot on the island, if you remember. Because I like the island because it still had green trees, so it would be protected from the wind. It got really windy and cold up there. And uh, it also had a lot of berries, and, and so it kind of gave me a good foraging area. And it was an island with the wind carrying my scent out to to see basically instead of inland so i uh yeah uh, you know you're taking all those factors into mind and you know i was you know i'd see i saw moose tracks not necessarily fresh but i knew they well they're in the area so uh yeah so that's kind of what informed how my first strategy was going to go forward and you know having seen that rabbit on the first day and shooting it i i hit those hard i uh, just started putting up snares everywhere <laughs> yeah, and hiked, hiked just ran trap lines for you know miles up and down everywhere uh so that was my that was my initial okay these rabbits will get me I, you know but i had never just lived off of rabbits of course i had heard of rabbit starvation and all that but i didn't know how long that would take you know i thought maybe you could if you get enough rabbits maybe you can drag it out for six months or something just eating rabbits <laughs> but it's yeah. actually it actually barely keeps so, up with uh starving anyway so i do have a couple questions but i do need to give a quick thank yeah. you to our friends at garmin uh now i don't know how big you are on technology uh with your mindset but um i'm a huge <laughs> fan of garmin it. man yeah. i utilize a lot of garmin products i use their in reach quite a bit i love their garmin yeah. instinct um had you had a garmin with you uh <laughs> You could have reached out to family. That's what's so special to me, man. Um, you know, not only it, it's important to have some of the functions uh, that could literally save your life if needed, um, you know, to where you can reach back out and, and, and get help if needed. But to me, part of being out in the woods, part of the hardest part is the emotional um, toll it takes on you. And you know that better than anybody. But even being out for 10, 11 days, mm -hmm. And you've got little ones back home and that garment in reach mm -hmm. just makes it to where I can reach back out and say, Hey kids, I love you. Um, you know, daddy hasn't killed anything yet, but you know, we're going to hang in there and sleep tight tonight. Just being able to reach out and then being able to get a text back saying, you know, we love you too, daddy. Um, that just keeps you emotionally in the game. So, uh, I would certainly go check out all of Garmin's products, um, because they have some, some fantastic things for not only survival, but, uh, you know, my daily driver is the, is the Garmin instinct, uh, to go to the gym and, and, and track my fitness levels and, and recovery and all that stuff. So, so go check out all of Garmin's products. Now, um, you mentioned rabbit starvation. I'm curious to yeah. know. Yeah. If you got protein and fat coming in, um, and you can have enough rabbit, how would you ever starve off of it? Well, the problem is, is, you're not getting really any fat when you get rabbits. So you get a little bit. Um, I, I, I kind of, from my calculations, and I was catching quite a few rabbits, uh, but eating, you know, whatever it was, even a rabbit a day, whatever I was eating, it was like, uh, I think it made up for the, the miles I was putting on. 
So I was putting on quite a bit of miles just trapping, but I don't think I w lost weight any slower than anyone else. You know, we were all losing a pound, a pound and a half a day, even though I was catching a lot of animals. But I was also putting on a lot of miles and learning my terrain. And, uh, you know, you learn a lot more about your what kind of animals are moving where if you're out and about rather than conserving calories. So I think it did pay for that. But yeah, there's just not much cat fat on a rabbit. So it, you're getting plenty of protein, but your body doesn't really use it without also an equivalent yeah. amount of fat. Um, you essentially have so, to follow, you essentially have to follow, I mean, out there, you're, you're, you have to, well, let me ask you, what, what, what did you have a goal in like, I, I want to get X amount of fat and X amount of protein going into this? <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I hadn't calculated it out. It was just as much as possible all the time. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> and so, uh, and you know, even after, and we haven't gotten to the moose yet, but even post moose that I never felt the pressure leave. I never had enough food because I still knew even if I eat this whole moose, I'm still going to sometime have to leave. And the reason is going to be because I'm out of food. So if somebody else gets a moose and I have a moose, that's still not enough because I'm still the skinniest guy. So I got, <laughs> I got to make up for yeah. that. And I was just always picturing it like, man, I'm like 40 pounds lighter than this guy's like 40 pounds of fat in the woods is really hard to come by. <laughs> so yeah. That's not something you can dig up very easily. So I always just had that, uh, you know, that reminding me. So I never felt comfortable with the amount of food that I had. And I, you know, there was no upper limit really. It was just so, always as much as I could. One thing that, that so many sportsmen pass over is, is that, you know, we preach like, Oh, I hunt to eat and I kill to eat. And, and, you know, I, I we preach that, but then there's so mm -hmm. much that we waste. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't even keep the ribs on a deer, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So there's so much that, that we just throw aside, but then yet we sit back and we preach, oh, I'm a hunter because I need to eat. Um, That's so at what, po at what point did you realize, like, there's, I can't waste anything. Oh yeah. You're, it's funny. It, like your mind almost shifts. Like, uh, you know, I'd be catching these big fish and I wouldn't, you, I wouldn't really want the fish meat. I just wanted the eyeballs and the head and the belly, you know, like the, your body like craves the fatty parts. Like I would just, I would, even with the moose, it was like, man, I want that bone marrow. You like break open the marrow and it was just like a gold, you know, liquid gold. Yeah. I just loved it. And your body almost transitions naturally once you're in that state, you know, kind of in your natural state here in the modern world where we're overwhelmed with enough fats and all that, that we, our body doesn't really crave it, but when you need it, you won't be wasting any of it. You know, it's like, it's, uh, yeah. it, it kind of right away. So I was, you know, eating all the rabbits and the heads and the everything I could. And I'd be catching, you know, I caught a bunch of little mice and just throw them in the pot, boil them up and eat them bones and all, you know, yeah. <laughs> so it's, you're now, just not wasting anything. Yeah. Has that, has that experience changed your eating habits since being back? Um, I'd say no. I think a lot of those particular lessons I'd learned in Russia. So, you know, over there, they also don't waste much. And so I had, uh, learned to really like the organs and the, uh, and there's certain things, you know, they they find the intestines to be a really, uh, a delicatess <laughs> over in Russia, yeah. whereas that's something here that I don't usually take from my <laughs> game that I take. <laughs> but uh, but I guess that's a luxury we have. Um, so those are all things I kind of got pre alone show. So I can't say that alone shifted that much. But uh, uh, but it is still you know my favorite part of any game I get is the heart. I, I'm always sad when i find people don't take the heart <laughs> are you kidding me? i've never tried it it's so good <laughs> so things like that so when you got like when you got back mm -hmm. was it like i'm gonna run to pizza hut and crush you know two large pizzas or was it like <laughs> or was it i mean that's funny you... you know when i was out there i was uh you're obviously not getting really any carbs uh to speak of i had a lot of berries but it's not Anyway, the uh, so I, for, when I was out there, I was craving. I don't know if you know what magic squares are, but my mom used to make them for Christmas. There's like a 
coconut and chocolate chips and stuff like real fatty sugary thing and when i was out there i found that's what i was craving but when i got back you know i had told my wife and mom that and they made it and i could eat like a half of one i was like oh, that's <laughs> too sweet that's enough <laughs> so, yeah i was like oh, they made this whole pot i ate like one bite and I'm like, oh that's about all i can handle but uh yeah i know so um no it didn't change my eating habits a lot you know i it was interesting. It was the first time I had been totally all meat for that long, you know, and and that was interesting. I felt really good. I feel like if I would have had a little more uh, proportion of fat, of course, I didn't know how I could have been out there for a year. So I was kind of conserving my fat a little bit, stretching it out if I would have been able to eat it. Um in the right proportions, you know, it might it might be a really good diet. I know a lot of people really swear by it. But I know I never missed anything. I was actually like, every time I ate, I was just like, man, this is so good. You know, I, I, <laughs> I wasn't overwhelmed by cravings for other things. Uh, I was really happy with the moose <laughs> and the fish and whatever. <laughs> so I know, uh, I know you've been on uh, Joe Rogan. Uh, and uh, when you told him about, you know, surviving and enjoying the carnivore diet, did he almost just go, sure. told you so? Um, because he's a big carnivore guy, man. And, uh, and you know, he, he, I don't know if he still practices it or, or how often I don't think he, he still does it, but he did do it for a period of time. So it's really interesting. That's one of those things I always feel like even for people listening, if, uh, and I think about this when I have friends that are, have like autoimmune issues. I mean, if you've tried a lot of things and you can't figure out your autoimmune issues, I would say, try doing the all meat diet for a little while. It might. I was, so my buddy in Russia got Lyme's disease and encephalitis really bad. It, it basically took him out for years. There, you know, it was terrible. Uh, he's a real happy, productive guy and he got all depressed and he couldn't move. And anyway, he finally went on an all meat diet and it, it, he couldn't believe it. He felt like it was a miracle. He's like, I forgot how sick I was. He basically went on it for a few months and then tested negative for his Lyme's disease. And, uh, basically cured limes doing that and uh it was a very a very uh interesting thing to see because there was definitely no placebo effect going on there uh so i don't know I, it's definitely one of those things i keep in my back pocket if ever i need to really shake up my diet again and try something else for some reason yeah. <laughs> the other thing you know you kind of you naturally lose a lot of weight it's not something that i have to work to do but i thought if, if i had a I was the type of person that was heavy and wanted to be lighter. I would, uh, I would also look into it because I was, like I said, I was always happy. Always, you're eating these big steaks and it's delicious, and then somehow you're still losing some weight, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was, it wasn't uncomfortable. It's not like you're fasting yourself to lose weight, but no, I man, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I actually, um, so I used to be about fifty pounds heavier than I am now, and uh, oh yeah. And really, I mentioned I mentioned that Idaho hunt, and and that's what kind of got me uh, looking at myself and thinking, man, I I gotta lose some weight. Um, oh, cool, yeah. I'm about, go, I'm about to go trips around the mountain, and uh, I gotta lose some weight. And so I actually started a ketogenic diet. Um, yeah. I wasn't I wasn't carnivore, but I was I was very 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 low carb and very very high uh -huh. fat, and and I function uh -huh. really well on that. And uh, and I know cool. what you mean. It's like, dude, why on earth would I ever? I mean, I get to eat steaks. I ate like a steak a day, uh, maybe a steak <laughs> yeah. another day, but, uh, and, and even now, the pressure still, on hunting. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So. And even now, so still, I still practice it. Um, you know, I, I still practice a ketogenic diet six days a week. And then I have a, what I call oh, wow. a refeed day. Um, yeah. where I just eat whatever the crap I want, whatever's in sight. And, uh, yeah. that kind of keeps me balanced and I, I really enjoy, uh, and, and, and I'm not carnivore, but, but, I love meat, and so I, you know, I tell people I'm like real similar, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a. I was amazed. I was like, man, I thought about that a lot on the one. I was like, people that really want to lose weight, this is the way to do it. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you have weight yeah. problems, just sign up to go on a loan, and you'll lose a lot. <laughs> um, now walk me walk me to the moose um, because like you said up to that point no this is something that nobody had accomplished on the show yet so with with five seasons in um, 
I mean, nobody had done this yet. Um, walk me through not only the hunt, but like what that, what that really meant for you in terms of the show. Oh yeah. It's just, you know, I wasn't thinking it in the context of the show at the time per se. I did. I think I did later maybe more, but I, then it just felt like basically felt like I was in a real situation. I wasn't thinking of it as a show. I was like, I have to get food or I'm going to die. You know, (laughs) I felt like I had this, I mean, and I was getting a lot of rabbits, like I said, but it, it just, you're just living foot to mouth, you know, it's or hand to mouth, whatever that phrase is. And, uh, and so you just always have this burden of what felt like a, you know, just felt like a giant demon on your back. That's just like, I'm going to, you're going to starve. You're going to starve. You're going to starve. <laughs> yeah. It's like, ah, no way to shut it up. And then, and then, oh man, I mean, and it was, it's a long fun story about hunting the moose, but when I finally happened, it was, there's, a, there's no way to recreate the joy of like that moment where not only is it a successful hunt and we all know how like, how awesome that is but with so much on the line and when it feels like you're gonna starve or you're gonna get food and then all of a sudden you get this 900 pound beast and it just slayed that little demon on your back it's like yeah yeah, so much joy it's like so much pressure off of you it's it's it was incredible um yeah it's it's really hard to repeat that it's really cool to think about the you know people for all of human history that had to hunt and gather and provide and that was the feeling they were up against all the time you know like uh yeah they went on a lot of those types and that's and and that you might have had this conversation with somebody since but that's my biggest argument when somebody you know when somebody says oh i can't believe you're a hunter how could you be a hunter and i'm like well listen the idea of not hunting is relatively young not relatively very young you know if a hundred years ago you said you didn't believe in hunting you would get laughed at well how are you going to eat what are you going to eat? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I always tell a non-hunter, you don't believe in hunting. Well, let's put you out in the woods with Jordan Jonas. Um, you, know, <laughs> yeah. you can be yeah, able to use, but let's put you out in the woods and, and let's see how yeah. quickly you decide you it's okay to eat meat. Yeah, no, for sure. And no, there's just no doubt in those situations. And, you know, now people do have more options and that's fine, but it's a very recent development. Like I said, uh, and the good thing about it, I mean, I, I really like, I haven't spent a lot of time in Russia. It makes me appreciate the way we manage game in the States and the way that people in general respect the law. You know, you don't have poachers everywhere shooting everything they see. So we actually have a pretty good relationship of people and hunters that can also, uh, and have game populations that are sustainable. And I think it's, I, I I appreciate that a lot. That's one of the things we can be grateful for in our society that we can kind of have both and manage our game populations well and and get good food still sustainably from it. And so, yeah, there's no way to live in some of those northern environments, especially without and there's just no calories without getting game. Yeah, <laughs> there's not um, a chance. So after you got the moose. Um, uh-huh. Well, first off, I just want to say this. You, when you came home, you must have been like, you in your mind, you're like, okay, I left a little bit of a novice of a recurve shooter, but now I'm just, now I'm the best there is. <laughs> because if you don't shoot good, you don't eat. You don't survive. You're dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I definitely, it was funny. It's like, I was in the zone for sure. And uh, uh, I was making some shots I was really proud of, and I was disappointed to see most of them didn't make it on the show. But, <laughs> but I was. Uh, uh, What's the furthest shot you made? Oh man, what was the furthest shot? I made a I made a really far shot on a squirrel I was proud of, and one on a on a grouse that was up in a tree that I was happy for. I'm trying to think what the furthest yardage. I had a long rabbit shot that was good, and but I don't know, you know. It was probably 30 yards, but it was at a rabbit, so it was a small target. I was pretty proud of myself. Awesome. Um, the Yeah, so it was, uh, I mean, you're just, you're just shooting at a lot of little critters all the time. So yeah. it's, uh, I had a friend tell me one time, I had a friend tell me, if you want to become effective with a recurve, just 
just go hunt small game with a recurve and you will become effective with a recurve. Yeah, I felt that like I would get really, you know, you get really focused and when you're really concentrated and focused and again, the stakes are high. So your whole brain is in that focused mode. And I did find I was shooting really accurately. Uh, I've probably devolved since then, but no, <laughs> no, but I, uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I definitely improved a lot out there because I did a lot of shooting and I, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm better now than I was then actually, but it was the, the guys, I know the survival expert guys for the show thought I was a good shot. <laughs> so, so now coming off of it, do you, um, are you sticking with the recurve? Are you going back to a compound or? Well, I've done both. Like I definitely, you know, the pressure's a little bit on cause I, since I do have the family and I spend so much time in the woods, uh, even in the summer when it's not hunting season that I kind of got to maximize my hunting season. So I have, I hunt with the compound also quite a bit to try to fill the freezer, but um, I think I'm going to be more and more just recurve. I really do like it. And uh, so last year I chickened out and when I went elk hunting, I took my comp. <laughs> <laughs> I had a really epic hunt though. It was, a, it was great. But I, uh, this year I'm like, man, I just got to take the recurve, but it is, you know, when you're going up there for weeks and yeah, want to make sure you get something, but, uh, yeah, but no, I do, I, uh, that, that's yeah. my biggest drawback. I don't want to say drawback, but that's my biggest, yeah. um, you know, because my time in the woods is somewhat limited because, yeah. um, we don't, you know, I, I do have family. I do have young kids. Um, exactly. The same boat as me. So it's like, Put some pressure on a little bit, <laughs> but I want to be. I, I want to hunt with a recurve, but then I, you know, I yeah. don't want to come home empty-handed every day. It's embarrassing okay. when you're when your two-year-old's like, "Dad, did you kill anything?" and and you're like, "No, I didn't." And they're like, "Oh, you suck." Well, that's like, good. It's good to don't see you fail too. <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't understand. It's hard. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, so I do a little thing. Um, and this is kind of this is in 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 collaboration with my friends over at Rebel Six Rubs. Um, uh-huh. Rebel Six creates um, wild game rubs for all sorts of different wild games. So it's not uh, it's not you know a lot of stuff is like oh this tastes good on wild game. Uh, well, they make it so specific as to this tastes good on deer, this tastes good on on saltwater fish, and this tastes good on bear, and this tastes good, and this is spicy bear, sweet bear, whatever. Um, so they make a lot of different rubs for wild game which obviously I'm a huge fan of because I love eating wild game. So head to rubble six rubs.com. You can use bear one Oh one discount for 20% off. But I like to ask my guests um, something about wild game. Now we've all obviously already talked eating wild game and I never have one specific question I ask, but I do for you uh, because I saw you post two of my favorite things uh, are bear hunting and, and donuts. And I saw you post um, on Easter morning, homemade donuts fried in bear fat um <laughs> so i never i never give one thing and tell you to and and say that's what you have to talk about but i really want to know how you make your homemade donuts in bear fat oh man well you're asking the wrong guy no i make the bear you know everybody knows how to make bear lard right and the but well, you just render down your uh big chunks of lard off of black bear and uh you get this this lard that turns out to be about the like best tasting fat that you can have it's very mild almost slightly nutty uh perfect for frying things in you would think that bear fat you know if you haven't had it before that it would not be the thing you'd want to fry sweet donuts or something in but it uh it it really is it's it's an excellent frying medium and unfortunately it's not me that made the batter for the donuts <laughs> i don't exactly know what they, we have a tradition here we got a lot of good friends and family and in, in town and uh we got an easter morning tradition of going and making donuts over the fire that we've done for you know decades now so uh so all of us come together we you know bringing some bringing lard some bringing their donut recipes and and uh, so that was a congl- that was a group effort on that one. <laughs> no, that was awesome. So I can only give you a sliver of the recipe. That got me fired up. Uh, that really did. I was like, oh, oh Lord, I got to go harvest it. another bear. I uh, know, man. Once you start it, it's actually like bears are pretty inspiring. I mean, I'm, I've had a lot of bears, and they've all tasted good, which is strange. Maybe I'm just lucky. But 
some people don't like bear. I don't understand. You know, I've why. heard I've heard some people, and I've heard some people they're like, you know, I killed a bear, same area, and actually the guy I'm referring to, this was in Idaho. He's like, it was in the same general area, uh-huh. and he said one year the uh-huh. bear was just delicious, best tasting meat I've ever had, and then the next year it was yeah. garbage. Um, so I don't yeah, know if that's how it just sure. kind of always is. Uh, hit or miss, hit or miss, I guess. Uh, but I really believe because the bear I shot last year, I was in Maine in the fall. And so that it was so fat with berries. Um, so essentially the meat yeah. was just marinating in berry juice. Um, so it was incredibly yeah, I, I do, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I do tend to fall hunt bears too more. You know, we get more of our bears in the fall than the yeah. spring. So I think it's, that's uh, just, I think that plays, plays a big difference, difference yeah. because then in the spring, they're so much leaner yeah. and they haven't put all their weight yeah. to go into hibernation. And so they just taste so much better, so much fattier, so much, you know, d- more, more delicious in the, in the spring or in the fall than they did in the spring. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> now I do got one more question for you. Um, I like to ask my guests for a tip. Um, for, for a, a, a field note, uh, Fred bear was big on his field notes. And so share with me a field note that you took while, you know, in the process of the show, something where you're like, I need to remember this and I need to learn from this, uh, something that I can take and put in my back pocket and make me a better sportsman with. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's see. There's, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you learn. Um, real, you know, really being in tune with your, viewing everything as an opportunity i guess like even uh even your failure so even when i you might remember the show when i missed that i missed the moose the first time which was embarrassing um <laughs> but, <it's, laughs> but it was i was way off on my range estimation because it was out in a mud flat yeah and, uh, you know if you ever try to judge distance it's very hard and it was a big moose so i had only one arrow with me uh stupidly and i launched it under its legs and then uh one of the it's just funny you just you just think of things right away as opportunities you know one of the things i thought of was oh man i gotta go put yard stakes out in the mud so that if i ever see another moose out there <laughs> i know how far it is and then uh how far did you shoot it when i got the moose it was like 23 yards so but that was my you know the, the first the one i missed I assumed was 30 yards and it was 42 yards when I paced it off. I was just like, Oh my gosh, I wasn't even close. A little too. <laughs> and then, uh, but it was just in the flat and it was such a big animal that it looked closer than it was. It was, a, it was a much bigger moose than the one that I ended up getting. Uh, now had you ever harvested a moose uh, before? In Russia, I've been on a lot, you know, like they live off of moose. That's like the thing they get the most. So yeah, there's been a lot of moose involved um but never shot one with a bow or anything like that yeah no for it's me a, like and for a lot of guys a moose hunt is like a dream hunt oh it was a dream hunt i i've been mean, that was just a, what a what a for sure i very what a cool opportunity i would love to do it again just especially in almost the same way just go up there live off of fish and rabbits until i <laughs> fill a moose tag that would be such a cool hunt with your recurve now Hopefully, some people get a chance to do now, that. Now, what happened? Did you did you get to? You might have went over this in the show. Did you get to keep the school or anything? Bring it back and do a European. Uh, that was the worst. I like I packed it all up and like, uh, no. So I went to the airport and the lady like took the moose head. I had it tagged. It was all legal and everything. But then she set it on the co- conveyor belt and she was like, "What's in that bag?" And I was like, "Oh, it's the moose antler." And she's like, "Oh." I've sent those before. Uh, I got in trouble last time, so I don't want to send this one. I was like, whoa, well, wait a second. Like, why not? So you need a hard case. And I was like, well, where am I going to find a hard case for a giant moose head? And I didn't have any connections uh, in up in Yellowknife up yeah. there in the Northwest Territory. So I was just, my plane was leaving in, you know, an hour. I didn't have any way of getting any, getting anything. So I Literally had to set it in front of the airport front door oh. and leave it. It was very sad. Dude. <laughs> I'm still mad. I still feel like nature owes me a moose head somewhere. I feel like somebody <laughs> stumbled upon that moose head. Oh, well, the funny thing, somebody did. and Because, like, cause, like I had called my wife a bunch trying to get a hold of her so she could call the other people in Yellowknife and blah, blah. And anyway, when I was on the flight, my wife finally got a hold of someone up there, and they went to the airport and is already gone. So somebody... Somebody's like, oh, well, here's what here's what cool. makes me mad is somebody took that not knowing 
the value in that. And and not just, oh, this was on TV, yeah. <laughs> this was harvested, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but somebody probably took that not even realizing this was life or death for a man. Yeah, uh, I'm this, sure it's this just moose setting on the next wasn't to just a trophy, dead, but this know? was literally life or death for someone. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was amazing. You know, that was. Uh, it was. It is sad because I know it wasn't a big giant rack. Like nobody's that going to be bragging about it. But for me, it meant so much, and uh, it would have been really awesome to have. And I'm. It's too bad. I'm sure it's just sitting next to somebody's woodshed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because it's definitely not the nicest rack in Yellowknife. Yeah. <laughs> well, man, that, that no, but yeah. Hard. Now, um, walk me through, walk me through the story with the Wolverine, uh, because that sets you back uh, yeah. quite a bit. Um, how, I mean, how do you bounce back? Yeah, you know, and a little bit of that was, I, I had a lot of food, like, um, but the Wolverine when I first when I first butchered up my moose, you know, you get a lot of kidney fat around the kidneys. And I had found a milk jug out there. And so I stuffed that milk jug full of some of that kidney fat, probably half of it, and then set it out there. And honestly, in my, it was just my bad, but I hadn't had experience with wolverines. I, in Siberia, they have them also, but they must be less of them because in all my time there, we've never really ran into them. I always heard about them and this and that. Uh, well, in the Northwest Territories, there's plenty of them. Yeah. <laughs> So I had set my moose fat up on this shelf I built and I kind of, you know, in the back of my mind, just assumed a bear would come because it was still early. And, uh, I was like, cool. Well, a bear's going to come out here and all my meats on that shelf. And I, I had set my shelf across from my shelter. So I would have basically my shelters a blind also. <laughs> so, so I figured I might be able to get a bear also. And, uh, but a bear never came and I would have probably heard a bear, but I didn't hear the Wolverine. So I came out the next morning, you know, after the Wolverine came the first time and it just looked, it just trampled the whole place and stolen that jug, which now had all that fat, you know, in it. And, uh, I tracked him as long as I could, but I never found a fat again, which was a real bummer. You know, like I, I, uh, I definitely had a lot more, but that was, weeks you know that literally meant weeks of food out there so i it could have been the difference maker for sure um and so that wolverine was also they're very bold they don't um like he'd come in the middle of the day i'd be there scraping the moose hide and i'd turn around and he'd just start by and try to grab something you know and uh and i was like holy crap it's definitely going to go down between us he was trying to kind of <laughs> claim the meat it was, it was going to be me or him and i kind of knew that for a long time <laughs> but, I, but i uh again I, I set up you know like a early warning system of cans that i'd found with paracord and like ran it all around and so the night before i got the wolverine i heard the cans and i ran outside and that it was at night and the i could shine my flashlight at this bush and you know the wolverine was behind a bush and i was like man i should shoot it but I just figured he'd come out from behind the bush. I'd get a clear shot. And uh, somehow he like just vanished and I never saw him go. <laughs> I was like, dang it, I should have just shot him through the bush. Well, the next night, uh, the same thing happened. I heard the clank, clank. And then I was like, oh man, he's coming. And so I came back out, threw my camera out there and everything. I knew where his like main trail was at that point. And then once again, he came running down the little trail and went behind that bush again. And and that time I just didn't hesitate. I was just like, <laughs> shot through the bush. and. The arrow kind of skipped through the bush, ricocheted through there, and it was a big alder, you know, clump of alders. So they're like, uh, so it basically pinned his hind leg in the branches of the alders and into the ground just for, just for a little bit, you know, like, I don't know how long he would have been there, probably not very long, but I just could tell he was pinned and flipping around. And so I just grabbed my ax and ran over there, uh. In the end, he wasn't pinned by much, but it gave me enough time to swing at him a few times. It was like it was such a different experience from the moose because the moose, it was like, you know, it, I was like living, I was alive, like feeling the whole thing, like this is crazy. And then with the uh, wolverine, it was just all instinct took over as soon as I hit him with that bow through the leg. It was like full on primal mode. As I uh, just, well, dude, hit I still I can picture it all. Oh yeah, it was definitely. We were, uh, yeah, well, he was <laughs> my nemesis out there. And then, you know, I finally, 
I finally got him. It was uh, pretty crazy. And I swung the first time and it disemboweled him. And then he like spun around and flipped around and lunged towards me. And I swung down again and got him and then just swung, swung, swung. Dude, those things are vicious. And I was like, oh man, I cannot believe that just happened. Uh, It was shocking. And then, but I was also a huge, I was like, holy crap. Yeah, no, (laughs) Wolverine. Now I'm just getting like live in bliss here and just eat meat and hang out and fish and uh and then i was sitting there like two days later cooking some meat over a fire and i heard out in the woods i heard another one and i was like no way am i just making up that sound but i knew i wasn't and sure enough there's another another wolverine but we were only allowed to take one so i had to just play defense on the second one (laughs) it was frustrating (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Sounds like it, man. But, yeah. You know, we got to worry about coyotes. You got to worry about wolverine. Some of my friends in Australia are like, are like you know, uh, kangaroos are the epitome of them. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know uh, I had a friend tell me one time. He's like, man, I've had so many good stocks on an animal blown because I'm like boxing a a kangaroo that rolled up on me. You know, <laughs> hilarious. Well, man, thank you oh, so much man. for coming on. Uh, before we go. I do need to give a quick thank you to my friends over at minus 33 Merino wool. Um, I am a huge, huge, huge proponent of Merino wool. Um, I believe you are too. Uh, but Merino wool is just Mm -hmm. absolutely, it's magic, man. Um, it's antimicrobial. It, it, it doesn't hold, uh, scent. Um, so it, so it's, virtually scent free over a long period of time uh it 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 has an amazing properties to to keep its warmth even when it's wet uh so merino wool is just fantastic and my friends over at minus 33 do it and do it well so go check out minus 33 uh next time you buy some merino wool i stumbled on them by accident I was placing an order on backcountry.com and they were having a sell on, on minus 33. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot and uh, just fell in love with it. Softer than all my other Merino. Um, so go check out minus 33. Jordan, thank you so much uh, for coming on my friend. It was an absolute pleasure and uh, I hope to have you yeah, on Dylan, again. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Anytime. I appreciate it. It was fun chatting. There's plenty more to talk about. I'm sure. Oh yeah. Uh, hopefully <laughs> one day, man, I can get out to one of your classes and, uh, and 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 awesome. see what that's all about oh yeah it'd be awesome you can like yeah and if anybody wants to follow along i'm on instagram at hobo georgia that's probably the best place and uh but yeah you can get a get a jordanjonas.com has some of those courses and stuff up there but yeah it would be super fun they've been great it'd be fun to see you out there you're welcome anytime all right my friend well <laughs> thanks again for coming on i appreciate your time <laughs>